Hi, so it looks like uh, we have a couple more people logging on here, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hi, welcome to QGive webinar. Um, I'm so happy that you can all join us today. Um, what a 10 months it's been, huh? We've had, we've experienced several once in a lifetime events in only a span of a few months. But despite these challenges, it's inspiring to see everyone come together and see all the work that your nonprofits do to continue providing life-changing services. Last year, when events had to move from in-person to virtual events, uh, we hosted this webinar to help uh, nonprofits such as yourself make the transition um, and to provide some real examples on how you can accomplish this. Uh, today, we'll take a deeper look into what's worked over the last 10 months, and we'll discuss some of the real examples that our nonprofits um, that work with QGive um, have virtual events and why they were successful. Um, so a few things before we get started. We are recording this webinar. Uh, we'll send out a copy to everyone in our follow-up e email, um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we want this to be a dialogue, so please ask your questions, submit any, and there's a questions and comments tab. We'll get to as many as possible um, throughout the course of the webinar. If at any time you experience sound issues, please try dialing in by your phone. Uh, sometimes faulty internet can cause a lag. So uh, the number is in your registration email. Um, so, so a little bit about myself, as uh, you don't hear Abby speaking, she's the one that normally hosts these webinars. Uh, my name is Justin Cook. I am the product marketing manager here at QGive. Um, and it is my job to educate nonprofit organizations such as yourself and all the projects products that we have to offer. Uh, for those that don't know us, we provide a full fundraising platform to help nonprofits grow. Uh, everything from event registration, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, text giving, auctions events, and donation forms, all to help you raise more through a multi-channel approach. If you're interested in learning more about what we can do for you, uh, please reach out, we're happy to help. Uh, now for the speaker that needs no introduction, um, but I'll give her one anyway. Abby Jarvis is our nonprofit education manager here at QGIVE, and up until this point, she's been single-handedly running our webinars program. Uh, she has over eight years of experience helping nonprofits grow their fundraising program and is a board member of a local nonprofit organization here in QGIVE, uh, here in Lakeland. So without further ado, take it away, Abby. It's not 2021 if you haven't started a, a webinar by speaking on mute. Uh, well, yeah, so that was on me. None of that was on you. Uh, that said, a couple of you did let us know as Justin was talking that you were having problems with audio. If you do, uh, try calling into the number that is in your go to webinar confirmation email. That will help a lot. Okay, so. We kind of alluded to it a minute ago, but uh, Justin and I and the rest of the team at QGIVE did this presentation in March of last year. Uh, so we've been now doing virtual and hybrid events for about 10 months. And one question that I'm hearing a lot is how much longer are virtual events going to be the norm? And the answer is, uh, the short answer is, it's gonna be the norm for a very long time. Uh, the longer answer is one of the reasons it's going to be the norm for a long time is because people are going to have varying comfort levels when it comes to going into kind of the events world again. And nonprofits are learning that uh, we can actually save a lot of money by running these virtual events. Donors get excited about them just like they do about regular events, and it helps us save on overhead. So we don't see nonprofits kind of moving entirely away from virtual or hybrid events we see that kind of sticking around for a while. So here's a little bit of why we should focus on putting together great virtual campaigns. One, COVID-19 is still around. That is not surprising to anyone. Uh, and we're gonna need to focus on staying safe and healthy for a long time, uh, even as people start getting vaccinated and cases hopefully start going down. Right now, that's not the case. And all of you know, we're moving into spring event season, so <laughs> it's time to think about it. Uh, the other thing that we see is that uh, donors have proven that they're willing to engage with us in these events. 
Uh, we know that nonprofits last year blew some of their fundraising events out of the water just because they were really creative with how they got their donors involved and because donors loved the nonprofits that they were that were putting on these events and they wanted to support them. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing, like I kind of alluded to earlier, is that these kinds of events often have really great returns because they have such low overhead. So you can put together a really fun peer-to-peer -peer 5K without having to work with the city to shut down the streets and pay all the permits. You can run a fun gala without having to pay for catering and venue space. Uh, lots of different ways to, to kind of save money on overhead while engaging your donors. So I also wanted to lay out before I get really into the nitty gritty, um, I've, I've gotten a few questions about what the difference is between a virtual event and a hybrid event. So they're very similar. One, they both do rely heavily on online activity. Um, you're gonna be posting extensively online. Your supporters are gonna be engaging with you online. Uh, the Things are gonna be pretty digitally driven. Uh, the difference comes into how people actually participate with you. So virtual events take place entirely online. Um, you don't really have any kind of a venue space. Your donors aren't really meeting up with you at any point. Hybrid events combine both virtual and in-person. So you may have uh, a hybrid auction where you have some people actually at your event space participating with you, uh, while people also are a good example of a, uh, a virtual event. So. What we're going to cover today, now that we have those things kind of settled in, our, settled in our brain, we're going to look at three different kinds of events. We're going to look at simple fundraising events. Um, those are going to be uh, things that don't require a lot of extra planning. They're pretty straightforward. They're not a lot of different moving parts, which is a phrase that gets used a lot of QGIF. We're going to look at silent auction events specifically. Those have been a huge popular thing for a lot of nonprofits, especially in 2020. And we're going to look at peer to peer events. So, uh, up first, I'm going to look at some basic best practices. These are going to be applicable to any fundraising event that you put on, regardless of its complexity or the style. Uh, so, one thing that you're going to want to keep in mind as we move away from an in-person event toward a digital event, uh, we're going to need to focus a lot on personal communications. So, uh, I just out of my own sense of curiosity. I'm gonna check in. Will you guys type into the questions box about how many emails you think you get in a day? Just, just curious. Uh, I'm seeing 80, too many, over 100. Yeah, someone is getting 500 emails a day. I'm concerned for you if that's too many. Okay, uh, so what I'm getting is a, a millions, LOL, someone says. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that you guys are getting a ton of communications. So are your donors. So as you are thinking through your communications process, uh, we're gonna need to kind of think beyond having just like one or two event uh, emails. We're gonna need to look at several different emails. We're gonna look at, um, you're gonna need to consider a social media strategy. You may want to reach out individually to people who are registering for your events or even donors who um, have participated with you in the past, but haven't registered yet for your virtual event, um, you're going to need to get really creative because we are all by the looks of this box being inundated with communications. Um, the other thing you can do is that you can actually actively reach out and ask people to get involved on an individual level. Uh, you can try targeting people that you know um, participate with you on a regular basis. You can try reaching out to uh, people who are big advocates for your nonprofit, who maybe um, can share what you're doing with their friends group or with their networks or with their friends and family. And then one thing that I do want to reiterate, because there is a lot going on right now, uh, we're going to want to reiterate to our participants how their involvement is going to make a difference. Um, so one of the big things about in-person events is that there's kind of a selling point. You get to go out and have a nice dinner, or you get to go mingle with people at an auction, or you get to go run a 5K. Uh, very often, those kind of bonuses or those value adds, which is a marketing term that I'm surprised that I just used, uh, <laughs> all of those value adds aren't really applicable anymore when you are participating virtually. So it's going to be important to reiterate to the donors what they're accomplishing by participating in your event. Um, we should also be focusing on communicating regularly through social media. Uh, I hear a lot 
of people who are worried about over posting. If you've ever worried about over posting about a, an event, if you could just drop a yes into that questions box, I'm very interested. Um, yes, all of you, all of you are worried about this. Okay, so here's a secret. I spend a ton of time on social media because of my job. I'm on Facebook or at least have it on in the background constantly. And I still miss important event notifications from local nonprofits that I have supported in the past. So don't worry too much about over communicating. It's really hard to do. Uh, so make a point, especially as you lead up to the registration period. Um, mm -hmm that you are posting regularly. You may even want to target your posts or boost your posts on Facebook if you have the, the finances to do that. Uh, one thing that we should all be really good about doing, and I'm speaking to myself here, I'm looking at planning a virtual event uh, for the nonprofit that I'm working with. So this is me talking to myself. We need to be really clear about how participation is gonna work. Um, especially when we are accustomed to having in-person events, people know exactly what to expect. If I show up at an auction, I know that I'm going to show up, I'm going to sign in at the table, I'm going to get my bid number, and then I'm going to go walk around and look at the, the auction items. Uh, that is not necessarily as intuitive for people um, who are attending a virtual event. Uh, Yakov just posted that over communicating by email results in unsubscribes. And I, yes, I wanna clarify um, when I said in that first point that we want to communicate regularly, we want to do that more on social media than we do in email. Um, there's a really fine line to walk with email between sending a ton of emails uh, and getting people to unsubscribe and sending enough that people are paying attention. So send some emails, but spend more time posting on social media. Um, I know right now, if you post once or twice a day, that is probably a pretty good cadence, um, especially if you have a large audience. Right now you can expect maybe two to 3% of your audiences to actually see what you're posting on social media. So don't worry too much about over posting on social. Yakov has an excellent point where you do wanna be careful about over sending through email. Uh, the other thing that I do wanna make, uh, make a note of is especially if you have older donors, like Rebecca just posted in the chat, if you have older donors or if you are running an event type that you've never held before, it's really important to have a plan in place for supporting your supporters and uh, kind of communicating with them and helping troubleshoot any issues that come up. Uh, so what that can look like. So pretend you're doing a virtual 5K, you want people to run in their neighborhoods and you want them to uh, tr submit the miles that they've run to you. Have someone on staff who's ready to answer questions about how to upload your miles, how to participate, do they need to print a ribbon. Um, it's good to have a point person established ahead of time so donors are comfortable asking you questions and no one uh, at the nonprofit gets flustered uh, by having a ton of unexpected emails. So some things to keep in mind. All right, the first thing we're gonna look at are simple events. And these events are kind of, this is a kind of a catch-all category. It's any event that doesn't involve um, auction elements, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, or a ton of other wacky moving pieces. Uh, these are just some ideas. So we've seen all of these ideas run in 2020 and they have all been extremely successful. So when we talk about simple events, I mean, um, you can look at uh, streaming speakers or fun activities. You can have some safe in-person events. Um, there, we're gonna look at a couple of ways that you can have these kind of laid out. But uh, we've seen outdoor concerts go over very well. Uh, we've seen lots of streaming classes that have gone over beautifully. We've seen some really fun telethons when, if you guys remember last spring when no one could get toilet paper, uh, someone in our hometown had a toilet paper telethon, which everybody tuned into because it was really fun. And it was a concert series that everyone could join in uh, from Facebook. Uh, this also includes things like food or supply drives. Uh, and it also includes some simple activity or fundraising challenges, uh, which I'll, I'll show you some examples of in a minute. Everyone loves examples. These are some examples of real life events that QGIF clients put on in the last year. Uh, we had a, what was that? 
there was a Disney bingo. Uh, we saw lots of bingo and trivia events, lots of fun event style to, to look into if you are interested. Um, we loved this whiskers and wine, especially because I have a cat and do appreciate a glass of wine. Uh, that's an example of an online telethon. Um, it was adoption updates. You were, could hear cute stories from foster parents. You could talk to the volunteers. And um, there was, I believe, actually a cat that was uh, the star of the show. I didn't actually tune into this event, unfortunately, so I can't tell you any more about what Precious did. Uh, but I also wanted to point out over here on the right, uh, this family, they were very sure to tell us that it was a family-friendly backyard burlesque show. Uh, it included a cocktail making class and a dance class and a couple of other things. It also had an online raffle, which uh, we noticed went over really well uh, all throughout 2020. So these are just some examples of simple events. Uh, I told you, or I kind of alluded to the challenge-based uh, fundraising events. This is what I was talking about. Um, we saw lots of different versions of this, but uh, this is kind of like, think about the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, but without getting cold. Uh, this is uh, called the At Home Everest Challenge. The group that put it together was celebrating uh, the anniversary of the first hemophiliac to summit Mount Everest. And the way they celebrated it was to challenge everyone to do 29 of something. So walk 2.9 miles, this guy climbed 29 flight of stairs, you could swim 29 laps, you could do whatever you wanted to do, but you did it and then you donated $29 and then challenged other people to do the same. This went over beautifully, they got a ton of engagement. This was also a really fun way to get people involved uh, when everything was super locked down. I think this was held uh, it was held in April where at least Florida was on total lockdown. No one was really leaving the house except to go grocery shopping. So if you're looking for really fun engagement ideas, this could be a cool opportunity for you. Uh, we saw tons of food and supply drives. Um, do any of you rely on in-kind donations? Is that something that, oh, I just saw someone that said that this was their fundraiser. That's awesome. Oh, the Everest Challenge was awesome. Karen, that is an awesome job. That was a great event. I was really creepy about following everybody who posts on the hashtag. Okay, all right, lots of people are saying that they needed uh, uh, in-kind donations. So these are two really fun examples of how to make that happen. One is um, an actual supply drive. So people asked for supplies to be dropped off at their location. Um, a couple pointers just on that. If you do that, let your donors know how to uh drop things off safely and make sure you have a pickup plan in place uh, for any staff that's going out to pick up supplies so we want to keep everyone safe <laughs> uh the kitties need to eat but we also need to keep the people safe uh the other thing that was really cool that i noticed a lot of was uh people putting together amazon wish lists um i know i personally have been shopping online a weird amount since everything has been happening i'm online and on amazon and it's really easy for me to add something from my favorite nonprofits wish lists uh, to my shopping cart. So um, I would, a couple pointers on Amazon wish lists. Share your link when you're posting about it. Don't ask people to go find you. It's very hard. And then be specific about what you need and why you need it. Uh, I included this example from the Hope Center, which was really great. Uh, they pointed out that everyone at, non, or at their shelter needs uh, underwear, but nobody really donates it. So they made an appeal specifically for underwear, and then they posted a link to their Amazon wish list where you could buy specifically what they needed. It's a great way to get exactly what you need. Some general best practices for this kind of event. You're going to hear me talk about communication, and you're going to get irritated with me by the end of it, but it's so important. <laughs> Um, we need to be very intentional about communicating what we need, how to participate, and who people can go to with questions as we're planning these events. Another really fun thing that you can do that makes a huge impact with not a lot of work is spend some time building out your donation receipt. Uh, if you are using any, any fundraising platform, you should be able to send out an automated receipt. Uh, it's a really valuable place to communicate with your participants. Uh, if you need to tell them, if you need to send them a Zoom link, if you need to send them an activity, if you need to send them a resource or an asset that you want them to use during your event, that's the place to do it. And it's something that they are going to look at. 
the other thing you can do is recruit people by intentionally recruiting others to get involved with your event. So um, Karen chimed in, said the At Home Everest Challenge was her event. It was wonderfully done. One of the best ways that you can get people to engage in something like that is to ask five or six people that you know will participate to kind of get some momentum going and get people excited about the, the event. So keep those best practices in mind. Now, if you are a QGIV user specifically, here are some tools in our system that can help you. Uh, so first, I did wanna point out that the simple event system, so things that don't involve peer-to-peer -peer or auctions or anything like that is available to you already. It is automatically included in the base package of QGIV, so it's there. Um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. You can build up packages, you can set up private packages, you can set up promo codes for people. Um, I included this screenshot uh, from Junior Achievement because you can see kind of where they set up the different uh, sponsorship packages. That's what that looks like. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. Um, the other thing you can do is to update your receipt that is um, in your control panel. And if you can, and if it's applicable, I really encourage you to use the conditional content feature. What that does is you can use it to insert specific language about exactly, or the donor's exact experience. So in this example, if you were this JA organizer, you had someone buy a gold sponsorship, you could include in your conditional content something specifically thanking that donor for buying a gold sponsorship. It's a really good way to make your receipts as personal as possible, which is a good way to get your donor's attention, it makes them feel really good about what they've done, and it boosts engagement. Uh, the other thing you can do, so if you are planning your event out way ahead of time, for example, and don't have your Zoom link ready, you can pull a report that shows everyone who has kind of registered for your event and then continue to send follow-up information. So if you are running an event on Zoom, I don't know why I'm harping on Zoom, but it's really popular. Uh, you don't wanna post the join link to, for everyone to see on your Facebook account. You wanna send it to a specific group of people. Uh, you pull a report of everyone who's registered and then send them the link with instructions on joining. Uh, it's much more efficient. It'll cause much less confusion for your supporters and you'll get better engagement. Uh, we're going to look at silent auctions next. I don't know about you guys. I love a good silent auction. If you have a gift basket out there, I'm going to be peeking in through the cellophane and all the other stuff. Uh, unfortunately, clustering around those gift baskets and those bid sheets, not the best social distancing tactic. Uh, so we're going to look at how to do this virtually. We do have some pointers and some kind of tricks you can use to make your silent auction more memorable and then boost engagement. Uh, so I really recommend if you can pull it off using streaming video to provide some entertainment. Uh, and this doesn't need to be bands or singers or anything like that. It can be keynote speakers. It can be um, locals who are actively involved in your nonprofit, who are sharing kind of why they've gotten involved. It could be um, clients who've benefited from your uh, your services, talking about what a difference it's made. Uh, so when I say entertainment, don't think like big splashy bands or something. It can be much smaller if you need it to be. Uh, do include participation information on your registration page and your receipt. Uh, the more you can communicate that participation information, the fewer questions you're going to have to field as the day approaches. Uh, I would also encourage you, this is a fun trick. So uh, usually when you go to a silent auction, you see the majority of the items when you get there. With these silent auctions, it is better to let your donors see the items that are going to be up for auction a couple of days in advance. Uh, if you are like me, I'm a very tactile shopper. That's why I like touching all the gift bags, which is not a good move right now, uh, but I can't do that if it's virtual. What you can help me do is look at all the things in the gift baskets by posting them online. We've seen people do it in PDFs, which was really helpful. They had photos and descriptions. Um, it's a good move. Let people get excited about your auction items ahead of time. If you have really big ticket items like uh, TVs or 
big experiences or trips or whatever you have going on, highlight those on your social media channels to get people psyched about it. Uh, one, you'll get people who are actively going to bid more excited about bidding. And two, that can be a, kind of a fun little way to promote that you're having an awesome auction and there's going to be cool stuff for you to bid on and uh, kind of drum up some attention for your, your event that way. One thing that we've seen that have gone over beautifully are online raffles. There are so many different kinds of raffles that you can do. They all translate really well to virtual, and especially if you're doing streaming video, uh, it's very engaging for your supporters. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the cool ones we've seen. We saw one do a wall of wine or a wine pull. That was really neat. We've seen people do like 50-50. Uh, raffles. We've seen all kinds of cool stuff. And that is a very kind of, it's not no effort, but it's a low effort way to get a lot of engagement. And then I would also encourage you to include some funded need items. Uh, so you can have people like me who maybe doesn't have the ability to bid on the really big ticket items, but I can certainly buy a backpack full of food supplies or a case of food for your food pantry or whatever other funded need items you've chosen or chosen to provide. Here are some cool examples. Uh, this one on the left, the summer kickoff campaign, I love that they kind of did a three prong approach. They had the virtual auction, they of course had the fun and neat items, and then they had some merchandise that you could buy. Uh, that's a great way to engage people and you can see that they kind of surpassed their fundraising goal. Um, this, this event on the left, nope, that's the right. This event on the right, Bill's Bash, was so much fun. Uh, they had a live auction. They did also have some peer-to-peer -peer components, um, but they had a ton of fun, engaging stuff, uh, even for kids had like coloring pages and Zoom backgrounds that people could download and use as they joined the party virtually. Um, it was very engaging and beautifully branded. I mean, look at that bear. It's too much. At, if you are going to be playing a virtual silent auction, here are some big best practices to keep in mind. None of you should be surprised at this point that I'm talking about communication, uh, but especially because virtual silent auctions generally have more of a tech bent, uh, you're probably going to want to communicate that and going to want to communicate how people can get involved, how they can bid, what checkout looks like, etc. That is also why the point person is going to be really important to establish kind of early on. Uh, if someone has a question about downloading an app or they want to know where they can view the auction items ahead of time, it's really important to have one person who knows all the answers uh, so everyone knows who to talk to and they can get an answer in a timely manner. Uh, I would also love to see all of the creative fund and need items that you can come up with. People have been unreal. Uh, sponsorships are always kind of a, a given, um, but people love really tangible things. So I've given, I've seen sponsorships, or not sponsorships, I've seen scholarships, we've seen backpacks full of stuff, we've seen food for families, we've seen art supplies for kids, we've seen all kinds of cool fun and neat items. So think of something that is tied to your mission that people would be excited about and then invite them to give that. Um, try a raffle. I went over that a minute ago. want to reiterate it. There are a bazillion different kinds of raffles. Uh, I do want to say, before I lead any of you astray, that for a lot of different states, they have different regulations about how to handle raffles. So do make sure you're following state laws and regulations around raffle tickets. Some people are very, or some states are very strict. Some states are much less strict. I wish I could give you more advice on how specifically to navigate those regulations, but they vary wildly from state to state. And like I said, I don't want to lead you astray. So try a raffle, but be careful about how you do it. Uh, some Q give specific tips. Uh, the first one is a big one: is to start early. Uh, we generally require around 30 days of lead time, especially if you need training. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. So we see the most successful auctions uh, are auctions that have very well established item images and descriptions, and those can take time to build and write well. Uh, we want to be as descriptive as possible with those. We want to have a lot of good pictures and 
uploading them, writing and organizing them can, can take some time. So give yourself plenty of time. You don't want to stress yourself out. You goodness, for goodness sake, don't want to stress out your donors. So start early. Uh, I would also love to point out the push notifications tool. We have a really cool push notifications tool where you can let donors know um, that they've been outbid. You can let them know if you have an item that is kind of closing soon. They're only going to be able to place bids for another two or three minutes. Uh, that communicating that way uh, is a great way to kind of boost engagement, get more bids and raise more money. Uh, if you have tons of items, we've seen We've seen some silent auctions that have hundreds and hundreds of items. And as a general rule, it is very handy to separate those items into groups. So the different groups of items will go up for auction at different times. And this has one major advantage. Um, if you are looking at uh, an auctions list, a list of items, it is overwhelming to scroll through 300, 400 items. It's much easier to scroll through like 50. So if you can split them into more manageable groups, people will be less likely to overlook items. They'll be more likely to find items they want to bid on, and they will be more active in the bidding process because they have fewer bids to keep their eye on. So try doing that. And then do take advantage of our training and support. It's we have free training, we have free troubleshooting. Um, you can buy like extra like after hours support if you need to, but we are here to train you and we are here to support you. So do take advantage of that. You don't have to do it by yourself. Um, and then this is, it's not really a secret, but it's not not a secret. Um, we are currently an app-based auctions platform. It is, that was built with in-person events in mind. And as people are steadily uh, putting out these amazing online auctions, we saw a need for web-based browsing. So that is coming up. Uh, I can't get too into specifics on the timeline, but we are uh, getting our first look at it. We get to test it and play around with it, I think this week. Uh, so do keep an eye out on your inbox. If that's something that you're interested in, we're gonna be announcing that release uh, as soon as we can. It's gonna be a really handy way to engage people, especially as you do come up with hybrid events. Uh, at the end of the year, if people aren't excited about going out to a big gathering, uh, they can participate at home on their desktop computers or at your event on their phone. So that is coming. Get excited about it. I know we're excited about it, uh, and we can't wait to show it to you. The last event type I'm going to go over is peer-to-peer -peer events. I wish I could show you the hundreds of amazing peer-to-peer -peer events that our nonprofits put together. I am actually going to send you another webinar uh, if you want to watch it after uh, we kind of send this out. Uh, tonight, but uh, that includes way more peer-to-peer -peer events than I'm able to show you today. People are amazing and creative, and I hope that you get to see all the amazing cool things that they've done. These are just a sampling of some of the event types that we've seen that incorporate peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Someone did ask earlier if the challenge-based, like the at-home Everest, if that's considered a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, event. Yes, it is because you are asking your peers to donate to a nonprofit. Why I didn't lump it in with this kind of peer-to-peer -peer event is because it doesn't involve actually building and sharing personal fundraising pages. That's kind of where um, I, I drew that line. So technically it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but it doesn't use a peer-to-peer -peer platform. So I included it in the simple events. Uh, we've seen all kinds of walks, runs, bikes. We've seen board game marathons, which was really cool. Uh, we've seen board members get involved with fundraising by building their own fundraising pages. I saw one really cool event put on by the Sharing Center that they uh, moved a luncheon where someone is responsible for selling tickets to a table. They moved it to a peer-to-peer -peer event where the table captains weren't selling tickets, they were raising money. So very similar. Uh, they also had to ask for support in this event like they did last event, but it was all online. Uh, lots of people having contests or challenges. You've probably seen something like that at an SPCA or something similar where you vote for like the cutest pet or something at a dollar a vote. We've seen national and community giving days um, like Colorado Gives or Minnesota Gives or Giving Tuesday. And then we've seen all kinds of really cool, wacky, out-of-the-box ideas um, that 
just blow our minds every day. Like I said, I wish I could show them uh, all to you, but I'm going to show you these instead. Um, this Sweet Bites and Bikes is a really cool example. This is also from the Sharing Center. This isn't their luncheon event. This is a different one, but uh, they had a community day of togetherness, but they focused that it was together separately and it was their 34th anniversary so kind of like the at home everest they asked people to um ride 3.4 miles or walk 3.4 miles swim 34 laps do whatever the the number theme has been really popular and for good reason it just works really well uh there's an example here of the red ribbon or, you know pink ribbon virtual run which is really fun uh we saw a lot of really creative ways to get people involved in runs remotely. Uh, just as a little side note, if that's something that you're thinking about, look into Map My Run or Map My Ride. Uh, it's a way for people to track how far they've run or how far they rode and then submit it to you so they can still kind of get the credit for doing a 5K without huddling up with 100 people at a starting line. And then um, there is this really cool Giving Tuesday kind of peer to peer event from Minds Matter. Um, I took a shot of this at the very beginning when they were just putting it together. They didn't actually raise zero dollars. They raised quite a bit. Um, I just took that screenshot out of poor time. Here are some specifics for QGIVE users. Uh, one, remember that your participants are not professional fundraisers and they don't necessarily know what they're doing. They're excited about supporting you, but they may need some guidance and they're certainly going to need some tools. So give them the tools that they need. Uh, they're going to need things like fundraising tips and ideas, but they're also going to need assets like logos and like pictures as they build out their personal fundraising pages. You can upload all of those resources to the resources section in your peer-to-peer -peer account. Uh, and then that will show up in their personal dashboards. Very handy. Uh, also, that's really great for your point person who doesn't want to field 58 emails a day about where your logo is. Uh, the fundraising badges are a really cool system if you want people to get and stay engaged in the fundraising process. Uh, we have some really interesting data around um, the number of badges people earn and how much they go on to raise. So that's a really valuable engagement tool. Another really valuable engagement tool is our email campaigns tool. Uh, that way, or that tool lets you connect with individual kind of segments of your supporter base. So if you have people who signed up and were really excited about it and then life got in the way and they haven't logged in in a week, uh, you can kind of send them a little nudge. Uh, if you have people who are getting really close to their fundraising goal, you can send out an encouraging email to let them know that they're amazing and that you're cheering for them. If you um, have people who are just absolutely blowing their, uh, their fundraising goals out of the water, you can reach out to them too. Uh, and then another cool thing you can do that I would encourage you to try is uploading uh, thank you email templates, uh, solicitation email templates, and some social post templates. Um, if you all think back to your first day as a fundraiser and how nervous you were as you sent your first few emails, you can kind of put yourself in your participants' shoes. They don't know how to ask uh, for support and they don't necessarily know the best practices about uh, how to ask someone for a donation, but you do. And so you can give them those resources and kind of take some of the fear out of asking. Uh, as you are planning all of this, uh, I know it can be overwhelming, especially if you've never put together a virtual event before, but just remember that your supporters love you and they want you to do well and they want to support you. Uh, your users and your supporters are used to virtual events. We have all participated in something like this. Uh, they're used to it. They're not going to be shocked by it and you can do it. Uh, I just threw so much information at you in 38 minutes, and so I'm going to do a couple quick takeaways. Uh, one, this is the, the simple events, despite the word simple, uh, they're a powerful way to get connected with your supporters. Uh, you don't have to do a ton of heavy lifting. You certainly are going to have to do some extra communications and maybe some, um, some extra planning, but you're not going to have to do a ton of heavy lifting, and you're not going to have to find a caterer, which is just great. Uh, that system is available to everyone that has a QGIVE account right now. Uh, just go into the events section of your control panel and start looking at the tools that you have available to you. Uh, virtual silent auctions can be very successful. It does require a little extra planning, uh, a little creativity, but um, 
if you are interested in those options, let me know. We can get some resources to you that will help you plan specifically. And I'll include a, our auction planner resource in the follow-up email that we're going to send you tomorrow. Uh, and also lots of peer-to-peer -peer events translate very well to a virtual format. Good communication, no matter what you're going to be doing, is your number one virtual fundraising asset. Uh, people are afraid of new things sometimes, but if they have someone holding their hand through the new experience, it is a lot less scary. And just remember, your supporters want to help you. Tell them what you need, tell them how to help, show them how to help, and then answer any questions they have along the way, and you are well on your way to a successful fundraising campaign. Uh, I have a few minutes for questions. I tried to keep an eye on the questions box, but I am not the best at keeping an eye on those and talking at the same time. So Justin, do you have some questions that I can help out with? Yep, let's start at the top here. So are simple events ideal for events that are normally high-end ticketed events? Mm, they can be. Um, I would have to think about what the actual specifics of the event are. So if the high cost of the event is typically associated with um, catering costs or uh, venue costs, it might be kind of hard to justify the big ticket number with a simple event unless you have some perk that's going out with it. Um, I might be willing to pay $200 for a, a gala with a nice dinner, but I probably wouldn't be as willing to spend $200 on um, an event that I would watch in my sweatpants in my living room. But that said, there are a ton of cool ways that you can use simple event concepts to engage those donors. Um, you may not be able to swing a $200 ticket price, but you could ask more readily for um, for donations, you can ask for more or for larger donations. Um, you may be able to kind of get creative and mention in some of your promotions that um, you know you're not spending money on catering or venues, so their dollar goes further. Uh, it, it depends on the on the style of event, but there is certainly an opportunity, not necessarily to sell expensive tickets to a virtual event, but to pivot that event. Ooh, hate that word. Just used it. Gross. Uh, to turn that expensive event into a virtual fundraising event with a little bit of a different spin, and then ask people to give more because they haven't already splashed out on that ticket. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of questions coming in about auctions. Um, so we have a few questions about how long their auction should be open, um, any type of virtual live auction tools uh, mm -hmm. that they can use, um, and some of the capabilities of QGIF for virtual auctions. OK, so I'm going to try to go down the list and remember all the things. So <laughs> someone asked uh, the best time to keep or how long to keep an auction item open? Um, I will say this. We have seen, as people put on virtual events, that they're leaving the bid windows for auction items open much longer. So whereas at an in-person virtual auction, you are obviously limited by time, so you would keep those open for a few minutes. Um, or for a few minutes, maybe a couple of hours. We've seen people leave uh, auctions open for days. So um, don't kind of limit yourself to the three hour or four hour time limit. Uh, see if you may want to consider leaving your auction items open for longer. Um, the benefits of that are that, especially if you're doing a virtual event and people are participating from home, they may not be glued to their desktop the way people are like totally engaged at an in-person event. Uh, so I would encourage you to kind of experiment, ask your donors what they would be into. Do they want to kind of participate gradually uh, over a few, a few days or do they want to just do a total blitz? Um, I would survey your past participants if you have them and ask your board for their ideas. Uh, that is going to be a little different for everybody. Um, what was the second one, the second bit of that question? Virtual 
auction tools that they can use. Um, so most likely the environment. So QGIV would be the silent auction platform that you can use. Uh, but mm -hmm. what's, what are some other tools that they can use to um, host a virtual? Oh yeah, so the most successful virtual silent auction I've seen actually used Facebook Live. Um, they, it was a big, it was big brothers, big sisters of Southern Minnesota. They moved their, uh, their auction event to virtual with a 24 hour turnaround time. And they did everything on Facebook live. So that included a, a live auction. They had the auctioneer they had already hired just went into their facility and they streamed the live auction. People bid, uh, through Facebook, I think just by commenting, I didn't get to attend that event, so I can't say with 100% certainty that they weren't also bidding other ways, but that's the way they participated. Uh, they also used Facebook Live to do all of the raffles and they did um, they did auction item kind of highlights on Facebook Live and they also had their uh, keynote speaker and like volunteer awards done on Facebook Live. So that is a great low cost option I really think any streaming event would be good as long as you communicate where you're going to be streaming to your participants. Um, we saw a lot of people do these over Zoom. Uh, so they had their live auctioneer, they had um, entertainment, raffle ticket drawings, everything done over Zoom. So any kind of streaming uh, would be great. Uh, as far as the what you asked about QGIVs abilities, uh, okay, so the big things i'm going to tell you about my personal favorite things because qgives auction platform is very big and complicated and if i talked about it in detail we would be here for the rest of the day i'm not going to do that to you so my favorite things uh you can sign in by yourself so if i joined an auction on my phone i could check myself in you don't have to do it it's a it's a great way uh for socially awkward people like me who don't necessarily want to talk to you face to face uh, i just want to get in the door and i want to go like find the guy with the hors d'oeuvres and I can just check in early on my phone and then just walk right in. Uh, I think that the other really cool thing is actually building out the uh, auction items. You can add um, pictures, descriptions, who donated the item. That's a cool way to kind of give a little kudos to people who have supported you. Uh, that's really handy. My other favorite thing, um, because I am always multitasking, is there's like a swipe to bid kind of interface where if I get a notification that someone's outbid me, they ask me if I want to increase my bid and I can just swipe to say yes and I increase the bid that way. Uh, the other really handy thing is the checkout. Uh, I can check myself out. I don't need you to do it. So the way that works is when I am kind of setting up my my auction app, I just pick a payment payment method. Uh, plug that information in and then at the end when the auction items are closed and the event is over I'll get a tab uh, it shows me an itemized list of everything on my tab I pay for it that way and then um, I'm all done and you can contact me to figure out how to get my auction items to me so I think those are the most handy things I'm certainly happy to get you in touch with someone who can give you a more in-depth look at that tool I could bore you to tears talking about all the neat things that I like about it but i won't so please get a hold of us we'll we'll tell you about how cool it is <laughs> yeah. um so last there's so many questions but i think the last one that we have time to cover mm -hmm. uh what are the best types of hybrid events and do you have any examples yes um so best is a really arbitrary word uh, and but, promote. excuse me huh and, yeah as well as promote okay what is the best way to uh, so i'm gonna pick the ones that I like the best and also the ones that have been most successful. So a uh, hybrid event that I've seen that was really cool is that Bill's Bash uh, one, that was really neat. So the way they made that a hybrid event is they encouraged people, one, to participate in the event, but they also encouraged them to have um, like their own individual private parties. So, uh, the way that would work, I have my, I call them my COVID bubble. They're the same seven people that are the only people I've hung out with since last May, March. Uh, we hang out together all the time. In this case, we would all get together 
we would have our own little like room where we participated with the with the bills bash we would all donate together uh, and then we could just operate as our own little party uh, i've seen that approach work very well i've seen other silent auctions do that uh, big brothers big sisters of southern minnesota did that last year uh, it was before everything was totally locked down people were still gathering in groups of eight to ten so they would encourage people to get together that way and participate as a table, stream together, um, have fun goofing off with each other in the comments on the Facebook, uh, the Facebook posts. That was really fun. Um, I think another great virtual event are like some of the things I alluded to. Um, at least here in Lakeland, we've had some really cool um, examples from our local art museum. So that would be considered a simple event. They are doing arts classes where you can either uh, apply to go into the facility and do the uh, the class in person or you can stream it virtually so everyone is getting a chance to participate but uh, a small group of people are able to actually go into the facility to do it that way um, that allows them to enforce the social distancing it lets them keep everyone safe it lets them keep everything clean uh, and that's a really a really cool thing to do We've seen similar setups with like concerts or movie screenings or plays where things are streamed, but people can also, if they feel comfortable, uh, go in at a limited capacity to the actual facility to see the play in person uh, as opposed to on their on their computers. Uh, I was going to point out because I do see so many questions rolling in. Um, <clears throat> It, let me let me know if this works for you. I'm going to send a follow up. It's going to have a webinar that um, you can kind of scroll through. It contains lots of other examples. I'm going to send some resources around virtual peer to peer and virtual auction events. And then um, I'll think if I can, I'll see if I can come up with some other kind of helpful planning resources. Uh, do feel free to tweet at us. We're at QGIF. Um, my social media manager probably hates me for saying that, uh, but you can also tweet at me personally. <laughs> um, my my Twitter handle is Abigail L Jarvis. Um, you can email me at QGive. Just get a hold of us. We do want to want to help you out. Uh, this has been a trying year for all of us, uh, but I know Justin and I are super passionate about helping nonprofits do stuff like this, and um, we want to help however we can. So get a hold of us. All right. Um, I just talked to you for 52 minutes. You were total champs for hanging in there with me. Uh, do let me know how I can help you. Um, I am excited to talk to all of you. I am thrilled that a couple of the people whose examples or whose events were in here as examples were here. I feel like I met a celebrity, Karen at the At Home Everest. You're my hero. Uh, this was wonderful. I love talking to you guys. Let me know what we can do to help uh, and we will talk to you soon keep an eye out for the follow-up email it'll come um probably tomorrow maybe thursday hopefully tomorrow oh tabitha um my twitter name is abigail l jarvis j-a-r-v-i-s uh you can tweet at me there all right guys bye everyone Later.